Good morning. Welcome again to Morning Devotions. Thank you again for our time together. It's the beginning of a brand new week. I want to thank the young people. You're helping me out with Psalms 91. Young people, it's so important that you learn to do this. And forgive me, young people, you need to get your brain out of TikTok. And you need to get your brain out of Facebook. And you need to get your heart and your mind. Loving the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Sunday in the service, I challenge you. You don't want to pick up the TikTok challenge every day. You want to pick up the Holy Ghost challenge every day. What is the Holy Ghost challenging you about for change and moving forward in your lives? All right, so young people, sermonizing done. All right, but thank you for helping out with Psalms 91. I just ask that you go outside. We want to see some green grass. We want to see some trees. Those of you who live outside the city, please, we want to see a rice field. We want to see a pineapple plantation. We want to... We want to see life, okay? We've been locked up in our condos for six months. So read Psalms 91 in the middle of a pineapple plantation. Just watch out for your legs. Read Psalms 91 in the middle of a coconut plantation. Read Psalms 91 in the middle of a banana plantation. Read Psalms 91 in the middle of a rice field. We want to see the outside, but more than that, we want to hear the promises of the faithful God. All right, so here we go, Psalms 91. Psalms 91 He who dwells in the shelter of the Most High will abide in the shadow of the Almighty. I will say to the Lord, my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust. For he will deliver you from the snare of the fowler and from the deadly pestilence. He will cover you with his pinions and under his wings you will find refuge. His faithfulness is a shield and a buckler. You will not fear the terror of the night, nor the arrow that flies by day, nor the pestilence that stalks in darkness, nor the destruction that wastes at noonday. A thousand may fall at your side, ten thousand at your right hand, but it will not come near you. You will only look with your eyes and see the recompense of the wicked. Because you have made the Lord your dwelling place, the Most High who is my refuge, no evil shall be allowed to befall you. No plague come near your tent, for he will command his angels concerning you to guard you in all your ways. On their hands they will bear you up, lest you strike your foot against a stone. You will tread on the lion and the adder, the young lion and the serpent you will trample underfoot. Because he holds fast to me in love, I will deliver him. I will protect him because he knows my name. When he calls to me, I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will rescue him and honor him. With long life, I will satisfy him and show him my salvation. Psalms 91. Before we go to prayer, before we get into the word today, I want to share something I've been talking to pastors about this week. I talked a little bit with our CS about it last Friday night. I talked with a little bit with our pastors that are good friends of mine in Africa this week. But this is something that's really been on my heart. So let me read you a couple of different translations. In Ecclesiastes 8, beginning with verse 2, I say, keep the king's command because of God's oath to him. Do not be hasty to go from his presence and do not take a stand in an evil cause, for he does whatever pleases him. For the word of the king is supreme. And who may say to him, what are you doing? Whoever keeps a command will know no evil thing. And the wise heart, and here's where I want you to see, the wise heart will know the proper time and the just way. For there is a time and a way for everything, although man's troubles lie heavy upon him. Now let me read it to you from the New Living Translation. Let's pick up a verse 4. His command, the king, is backed by great power. No one can resist or question it. Those who obey him will not go, will not be punished. Those who are wise will find a time and find a way to do what is right. For there is a time and a way for everything, even when a person is in trouble. Now, brothers and sisters, I want you to notice what wisdom does. Wisdom. And this is beautiful to me. Wisdom finds a time, 
wisdom finds a way to do what is right, even in times of trouble. Now, I would say COVID-19 qualifies as a time of trouble, wouldn't you say? Wouldn't you say that COVID-19 is a time of trouble? Now, the Bible has clear command for us. We have the Great Commission. Okay? We are to go into all the world and preach the gospel. We have commands of duties of ministry. Do you remember Jesus as he spoke to um, Peter along the shores of the Sea of Galilee after the resurrection? What did he say? He said, feed my sheep. And what did Paul say to the elders of Ephesus when they came to meet him on his way back to Jerusalem for his last journey and bringing the great offering? He said, take care of, care for the flock of which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers. So care for the specific flock that you have been made overseers over. And think with me back to Proverbs. We are to know the condition of the flock. Now, brothers and sisters, straight up, God's word hasn't changed because of COVID-19. But we do need some wisdom. Wisdom will teach us, how do I get people saved in the middle of COVID-19? How do I evangelize in COVID-19. Wisdom will teach us, how do, I, how do I teach them all things whatsoever Christ has commanded us, part of the Great Commission? Wisdom will teach us how to do this, how to find the time and how to find the way. Because please, I understand, in times of trouble, we don't have as much time. And in times of trouble, it seems everything takes longer to do. But he said, you'll find the time and you'll find a way to do the Great Commission. What about following people up that have been saved in, in your Zoom crusades? Wisdom will teach you how to do that. What about holding your connect group every week and, and helping the people grow in God? Wisdom will find a way. Wisdom will find the time and wisdom will find a way. What about getting people water baptized? Wisdom will find a time and wisdom will find a way. See, if we're looking for excuses not to work, COVID-19 is the biggest excuse in the world. Everybody said, I couldn't do it because of COVID-19. I couldn't do this because COVID-19, COVID-19. COVID-19 has become the greatest excuse in the universe for everything. But I don't want to stand before Jesus at the beam of seat of Christ. And Jesus says, why, why, didn't, why did you take that year off? I don't want to say, well, Jesus, it was COVID-19, so of course we took a year off. All the other preachers in the world were taking a year off. No, they weren't. Maybe some lazy ones were, but... Most pastors have been working harder than they've ever worked before. I teach the pastors. We are to feed the sheep. We are to care for the flock that the Holy Spirit has made us oversee us over. We are to know the condition of the flock. It takes a lot more time to do that right now. This is a, a, a year of intensive pastoral care. This is a year of intensive shepherding where we, it takes a lot of time. We, we can't go to the hospital and visit people. But you know what? We can do a a Viber video call, we can do a WhatsApp video call, we can do a, a FaceTime video call, and we can do three or four a day if the person is afraid or nervous. We're working very hard on the videos and FaceTime. We've got so many. I think we have a total of seven different productions right now that are going out, everything from fit for service to evening service. We've got so much going out. We've got a couple of special things like Daniel's prayer where we lead you in prayer three times a day. We, we've got some special things like uh, Jesus the healer where we take 15 minutes a day and this is especially for people that are sick right now. And I said, Pastor Rose, I just want you to act like I've been acting on, on, on my hospital visits. I said, this is what I want you to do. And I want you to sing to them and I want you to pray for them and share the scripture just like we were in a hospital visit. You want to learn hospital visitation, just listen to Pastor Rose right now. And those of you who are sick, listen. 
Sister Bev and the singers put on another uh, beautiful thing, another little 50-minute thing the other night where they just, people are having trouble sleeping at night because they're sick and they're tense and they're worried. So Sister Bev and the singers put together this beautiful little musical thing that's going to be put out there for you where it's peace when peace like a river. Peace. Jesus is our healer. and There's a peace that passes all understanding. Beautiful songs. So we're working. But I want to talk to you also about your ministry. This is not a time to relax. I want us to come out of this stronger than we've ever been. Your connect group stronger. We're, we're getting ready. We're Actually, we've drawn up the plan to build a church in Nyack, Cavite right now. And we've got about six more lots after this one that we're going to be looking at putting churches on. We have members wanting to donate us lots. We're very excited about this. We're, we're doing the pioneer one first. And if you want to donate a lot, we're looking for around 500 square meters or so, someplace around there. We've got a beautiful plan drawn out for a, a nice church building. It seats about 150, has a nice children's church, has a little apartment in the back for the pastor to stay in. So we can, we call these starter churches. So once we build it, the church will be self-supporting from day one. No rentals, no apartment rentals, no nothing. It's just everything is self-supporting from day one. So we're very excited about these things. But see, this is what wisdom does. Now, what about your ministry? Well, pastor, there's no way I can sing in the choir right now. The choir, my goodness, yes, you can. Just call, call up the choir pastor that you've been serving under. They're always looking to put more Zoom, cru Zoom crusades together. And oh, there's a way. So please forgive me. I know I'm, I'm this is Monday. And he said, pastor, <laughs> you're, you're making us jump into Monday really fast. Yes, I am. Yes, I am because there's a world going to hell. And right now, this COVID-19 thing is working so hard to shut down churches. And I just don't believe that the gospel is locked down. Church is not about just the saints gathering together in God's house. We've got a nation to reach for Jesus. So would you help us? We've got all kinds of, I know this sounds really weird, but we have hundreds of groups across the world right now that are saying, we want to have a cathedral of praise. And they're already meeting with our, our video services. I mean, we, we've got some exciting days ahead. This, this whole thing has opened up all new possibilities for us. Now, it's been a lot of hard work and we need your help. We need video editors. We need people. We need people who just get in there and work. Okay. We need photographers, video. We need a lot of video editors. All right. We need creative people. Whatever your ministry is, there's a job to do right now because this thing's not going to be over right away. So can I ask you today to get involved? Can I ask you today? Call your district pastor, call your pastoral department head and say, listen, these are my talents and abilities. I want to help do this in Jesus' name. Maybe some of you are IT specialists. You can help us work on fine-tuning some of our IT stuff. We've got a lot that we need to be doing. Father, in Jesus' name, you put people in the body. Jesus, you joined people to the church for such, such a time as this. Father, I ask with the creative abilities that you have placed within each one of them, now give them the confidence to step forward and be used by you, Father. How many thousands of souls will come into the kingdom because they just come and offer themselves to you right now. Father, use them in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, let's open up our hearts and spend some time in worship.
New Testament passage today picks up in 2 Corinthians chapter 1, beginning with verse 15. Paul writes back now his second letter, or really probably at least his third, because he said there was this former letter I wrote to you in 1 Corinthians. He said, because I was sure of this, I wanted to come to you first so that you might have a second experience of grace. Basically, he said, listen, I wanted to come to you first so that I could come and see you again, okay? I wanted to visit you on my way to Macedonia and to come back to you from Macedonia and have you send me on my way to Judea. Now, remember, this is all about Paul's final trip with the offering to Jerusalem. He said, listen, I, I wanted to go up to Macedonia, then I wanted to come back here, and then I would leave from here on my way to Jerusalem. He said, I wanted to, I wanted to have two experiences of grace with you. I like that. Was I vacillating when I wanted to do this? Now notice the phrase, I wanted, I wanted, I wanted. Paul said, was I vacillating when I wanted to do this? So, all right, uh, human desires. are not unbiblical. He said, I, I want you to do this. He said, do I make plans according to the flesh, ready to say yes, yes, and no, no, at the same time? No, just start, start with the human desires. Is it all right to have a desire? I, I want to visit my friends on the way. It's like when I, I go and preach a crusade and I'm thinking a lot about Accra because we just had the big camp meeting and Pastor Dag, I was so proud and so happy to be a part of this group of men. This group of guys, they are just... I sat in the board meeting the other night and watched them all smile and laugh and joke with each other and just wanted to sit back and just say, Lord, thank you for letting me be a part of such a great group of men. But 1.5 million people tuned in to that video experience last week, and it was a tremendous pastor's conference. But when I, I go over to, to be with Pastor Dag and Pastor Josh and them in, in Accra, I always say, I, I want to stop in um, Dubai first. I want to stop and see all of our members in Dubai and spend a couple of days with them first. Is that, a, is that an unbiblical thing to want? Of course not. He said, I, these are things I wanted I wanted to do these things. Now, they didn't think he was sincere, okay? They, they just thought he's just talking like they talk. He said, no, 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 no. He said, when I make plans, I don't make plans according to the flesh. I, I don't say one thing and mean something else or talk out of both sides of my mouth. He said, as surely as God is faithful, our word to you has not been yes and no. He said, I, I've not been a vacillating person with you. He said, so please, don't, don't sit there and start criticizing me and saying that I really didn't mean it. He said, I really did mean it. For the Son of God, Jesus Christ, whom we proclaim to you, Sylvanius and Timothy and I, was not yes and no, but with him it is always yes. He said, so Jesus is my example. He said, when, when we ask Jesus for things, <laughs> his answer is always yes. He said, that, that's, <laughs> yeah. For all the promises, ha, 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 for all the promises of God find their yes in him. That is why through him that we utter our amen to the glory, to God for his glory. All right, now notice the promises of God. God has one answer for all of his promises, and the answer is yes, but that answer is yes in Christ. Remember how I'm always telling you to add this concept of your spiritual position in Christ. Every promise of God in Christ, the answer is yes. And we'll study more about why that is in Romans, maybe tonight, maybe tomorrow night. That is why it is through him that we utter our amen. Amen means so be it to, the, to God for his glory. So, God, we come to God and we ask him for his promise. He says, yes, in Christ. We say, so be it for the glory of God. God receives glory when his promises are fulfilled in our lives. So when you look at a promise of God and you say, God, is that for me? In Christ, the answer is yes. Now, you have to say, so be it. And it is God who establishes us with you in Christ. All right, here's that in him again and has anointed us 
and who has put his seal on us and given us his spirit in our hearts as a guarantee. So, all right, we are sealed and we are guaranteed. So, seal is ownership and the guarantee. But I call God to witness against me. It was to spare you that I refrain from coming again to Corinth. He said to spare you. He said, all right, now, why did I not come? If, I'm telling you the truth, if it was my plan, if it was my desire, if it was my plan, my plan, my desire, and I meant it. Why did I not come? He said, to spare you. <laughs> he said, I really thought about it. He said, it, it, was, it was to spare you. I, I, I didn't come to spare you. Now, we'll understand more about this in just a moment. Not that we lord it over your faith. He said, I, I, I'm not trying to lord it over you. That's not my style of leadership. This is not Paul's leadership. This is not Paul's leadership style. He said, I, I didn't lord it over you. He said, but we work with you for your joy, for you to stand firm in your faith. He said, all right, my, my ministry among you is to bring about joy. He said, my ministry about among you is for you to stand firm in your faith. Now remember, there's no chapter divisions in the Bible, so Paul continues. For I made up my mind not to make another painful visit to you. So Paul had had painful visits. I mean, Paul had to go there like Papa and spank some people. I mean, he, he had to go and he had to say some unpleasant things. This is part of leadership. I wish it wasn't. But there are times you have to look at people and say, no, this is wrong, and take the consequences. He said, for if I cause you pain, who is there to make me glad but the one who I'm pained? He said, I, I don't like bringing you pain. He said, when I bring you pain, he said, who, who is there to make me happy? He said, we encourage each other in the Lord. We bring joy to each other. And if I'm there correcting you and rebuking you and exhorting you, he said... Who's there to make me glad but the one I pained? And I wrote to you as I did. As I wrote to you as I did. So that when I came, I might not suffer pain from those who should have made me rejoice. For I felt sure of you that my joy would be joy for all of you. He said, now listen, I wrote to you some really strong things. First Corinthians, okay. First Corinthians. First Corinthians is a strong letter. He said, I, I wrote you that very strong letter because I was sure that you would listen. He said, I don't, I don't want to come and chew you out again. He said, so I sent you this letter. Just, I, I sent you the letter to take care of the problems. He said, I wrote you out of much affliction and anguish of heart and with many tears, not to cause you pain, but to let you know the abundant love that I have for you. All right, now, here's a leader's heart. He said, listen, do you think it was easy for me to say all those strong things? He said, do you think I, I enjoyed it? I just got up that morning and thought, I'm going to just chew them out. He said, I wrote to you with much affliction, much anguish of heart. And he said, many tears. He said, I didn't want to cause you pain. I didn't want to hurt you. But he said, you know, when I write to you like that, I write to you to let you know the abundant love that I have for you. Now, you know what I've noticed with some pastors? Some pastors are really good at, I love you, I love you, I love you, mwah, 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 mwah. but they don't love you because they won't say the hard things to you. God said, those whom I love, I discipline. In fact, we'll get into some of that next Sunday in the services. Those whom I love, I discipline. Now, God expresses love by challenging us at times. Paul said, I, I showed you this, the abundant love I had for you, 
by being willing to say the hard things. Now, the super apostles, no, 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 they're into everybody loving them and let's keep the crowd together and let's get money from people. But he said, no, no, I showed you my love by, by saying the things that needed to be said. Now, if anyone has caused pain, he has not caused it to me, but in some measure, not to put it too severely, to all of you. He said, when, when I've challenged you about these things, he said, it has brought some pain to some folks, but it's brought to everyone. For such a one, this punishment by the majority is enough. Now, here we're talking about the guy with his father's wife. He said, I told you to get that guy out of the church. He said, that, that hurt me to have to say. But he said, that guy didn't cause me pain. He caused it to all of you. It's like people walk up to me and they say, Pastor, I'm sorry that person hurt you. I said, they didn't hurt me. They hurt all of you. Their, their, their sinfulness. You know, you, you, sometimes we think that everything, that's, everything that people do that's mean to the pastor is really all about the pastor. And you don't understand that that person is really attacking everybody. But the pastor is just like the focus. He said, now for such a one, this punishment by the majority is enough. Now notice, not everyone. Now again, this is fascinating to me. Not everyone did this. Not everyone participated in what Paul asked them to do. He said, by the majority, it's enough. So, should you rather turn and forgive and comfort him? Or that he may be overwhelmed by excessive sorrow. Paul said, I don't want this guy to be overwhelmed. I just want him to stop his sin. So I beg you to reaffirm your love for him. Now he said, I know this guy said a bunch of stuff. But he said, so that he's not overwhelmed by excessive sorrow. He said, I want you to turn as a congregation. And I want you to comfort him. Some of you need to go visit this guy. and Get him back into church. I want you to reaffirm your love for him. For this is why I wrote, that I might test you, to see whether you would be obedient in everything. Now here is a leadership test. He said, I ask you to separate from this sinful life. He said, when I did that, he said, that was a test. This is a leadership test. A leader can test people by asking them not to just separate themselves from people because, well, I don't like him, but to separate from that sinful lifestyle. He said, I wanted to test you and to know whether you are obedient in everything. He said, will you do what I ask you to do? Hmm. Now, as a pastor, I've done that a time. I've looked at people and said, you know, that person is just not living right. And you just need to separate yourself from them. That, that person is going to do nothing but get you in trouble. And it was a leadership test. Sometimes you watch people do what you ask for their own benefit. And sometimes you watch people go, no, 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 I can handle this. And then you see their lives devastated. He said, anyone you forgive, I also forgive. And what I have forgiven, if I have forgiven anything, has been for your sake in the presence of of Christ. He said, Paul said, this isn't personal. This was all for you. This was, this was all for you. He said, this, this removal of this sinful guy sleeping with his father's wife, his stepmother, he said, he said, this is, this kind of stuff isn't supposed to be happening. You know, I, I saw on a website the other day, Fox News, you can look it up. It, this kind of sexual sin is so weird that even to this day, even to this day, it's weird. Fox News has a thing on. 63-year-old woman caught having sex with her 43-year-old son by his wife. See, even the world still looks at it. 2,000 years later, the, people, the world still looks at it as weird. Paul said, now listen, I, I said these strong things and I took this strong disciplinary action. He said, it wasn't for me. He said, this was all for your sake. So that we would not be outwitted by Satan, for we are not ignorant of his designs. You see, when, when you, you leave that kind of sin in the church, you're being outwitted. You think, oh, we're walking in love. 
everything is going to be wonderful, and excuse me, all that's going to do is be destructive. He said, you're going to get outwitted by Satan, for we are not ignorant of his designs. We're not ignorant of his schemes. All right, let's open up our hearts and spend some more time in worship. It's wrong desire. Let the name of Jesus Christ and take me one step higher. Cause I know when I present myself with open arms and to his face. He looks at me with love in his eyes and take me to his lost and way. And I'm taking back 100 score to a tie, still a broken body man. So to him, for me, this is no token. He took my place and took my shame and bled and died for me. So call him, him, sing for shame. I thank, I thank God, God for Calvary. This and God's a break it took to save a bomb like me. Then they took him and they beat him while they cut his back and beat for rage. Crucified the Holy One and put him in his holy grave. He was trashed and abused and hammered to some wood. Struck with a plate of pain and it was all for my good. Don't take the praise and praise the one who gave the ministry. Look around, he was raised and say, I thank God for care. For the story goes on burking With the truth of God's own son See the air no longer flowed And the heart no longer beat But then Satan shook He was feeling the heat Jesus arose The day was promised from the start To give us away for a special day And made the play of heart That is to carry the cross In a word that is right In a time and no place Where there seems to be no lie We must say it
Old Testament passage today closes out the Song of Solomon. Now, I will give you a great truth. The Song of Solomon is not a book I've spent a great deal of time studying in my life. I've never really gotten the revelation of this. So we'll read through this fairly quickly, but I have to tell you, this is not a book that I've ever gotten a great revelation from. I'm sure they're there. And one day God will open up my heart and my mind and get revelation. But let's finish out the Song of Solomon today. Where has your beloved gone, O most beautiful among women? Where has your beloved turned that we may seek him with you? My beloved has gone down to his garden, to the beds of spices, to graze in the gardens and to gather lilies. I, my beloved's, and my beloved's is mine. He grazes among the lilies. Sound like an old song from the 1970s. It is. It was one of the famous choruses from the 1970s. Now, yes, I know the Song of Solomon is all about the beautiful relationship between Christ and the church. I get that. You are beautiful as Tezreel, my love, lovely as Jerusalem, awesome as an army of banners. Turn your eyes away from me, for they overwhelm me. Your hair is like a flock of goats leaping down the slopes of Gilead. Your teeth, so your hair. Your teeth are like a flock of ewes that have come up from the washing. All of them bear twins. Not one of them among his lost is young. Your cheeks are like halves of a pomegranate behind your veil. There are sixty queens and eighty concubines and virgins without number. My dove, my perfect one, is the only one, the only one of her mother, pure to her who bore her. The young woman saw her and called her blessed, the queens and the concubines also, and they praised her. Who is this that looks down like the dawn, beautiful as the moon, bright as the sun, awesome as an army with banners? I went down to the nut orchard to look at the blossoms of the valley, to see whether the vines had butted, whether the pomegranates were in bloom. Before I was aware, my desire set me among the chariots of my kinsman, a prince. Return, return, O Shulamite, return, return, that we may look upon you. Why should you look upon the Shulamite as a dance before armies? Chapter 7, verse 1. How beautiful are your feet in sandals, O noble daughter! Your th rounded thighs are like jewels, the work of a master's hand. Your navel, your belly button is a rounded bowl that never lacks mixed wine. Your belly is a heap of wheat encircled with lilies. Your two breasts are like two fawns, twins of a gazelle. Your neck is like an ivory tower. Your eyes are pools in Heshbon by the gate of Bath Ribbon. Your nose is like a tower of Lebanon, which looks toward Damascus. So uh, she did not have a small nose. Your head crowns you like caramel, and your flowing locks are like purple. The king is held captive in the tresses. How beautiful and pleasant you are, O loved one, with all your delights. Your stature is like a palm tree, straight up, and your breasts are like its clusters. I will say I climb up the palm tree and lay hold of its fruit. O oh, may your breasts be like clusters of the vine and the scent of your breath like apples. And your mouth is like the best wine. It goes down smoothly for my beloved, gliding over lips and teeth. I am my beloved's, and his desire is for me. Come, my beloved, let us go into the fields and lodge in the villages. Let us go out early to the vineyards and see whether the vines have butted, whether the grape blossoms have opened and the pomegranates are in bloom. There I will give you my love. The mandrakes give forth fragrance. Now remember, mandrakes were a aphrodisiac, okay? Remember the story of uh, Sarah. Let us go out early in the vineyards and see whether the vines have budded and whether grape blossoms have opened and pomegranates are in bloom. There I will give you my love. The mandrakes give forth fragrance. And beside our doors are all choice fruit, new as well as old, which I have laid up for you, O my beloved. Now, you know, I know that some of this sounds a little pornographic, but it is not. Sexuality was God's idea. Okay, there is natural sexual desire that we have for someone that we love. Chapter 8 now, Inside Marriage. Chapter 8, verse 1. Oh, that you were like a brother to me who had nursed at my mother's breasts. If I found you outside, I would kiss you and none would despise me. I would lead you and bring you into the house of my mother. She used to teach me. I would give you spiced wine to drink, the juice of my pomegranate. His left hand is under my head, and his right hand embraces me. In other words, they're laying down together. 
I adjure you, O daughters of Jerusalem, that you not stir up or awaken love until it pleases. Who is that coming up from the wilderness, leaning on her beloved? Under the apple tree I awakened you. There is your mother was in labor with you. There she was who bore you was in labor. Now notice, leaning on her beloved. You know, when a young, if, if a young lady ever wants to make a young man feel good that she's in love with, ladies, if you ever want to treat your husband good, just take their arm and lean on them as you walk. Set me as a seal on your heart, as a seal upon your arm. For love is as strong as death, jealousy as fierce as the grave. It flashes a flashes of fire, the very flame of God. Many waters cannot quench love, neither can floods drown it. If a man offered for love all the wealth of his house, he would be utterly despised. We have a little sister. She has no breast, so she is pre-puberty. What shall we do for our sister on the day when she is spoken for? If she is a wall, we will build on her a battlement of silver. But if she is a door, we will enclose her with boards and cedar. I was a wall, and my breasts were like towers. Then I was in his eyes as one who finds peace. Solomon had a vineyard in Balhamad, and he let out the vineyard to keepers. Each one was to bring for its fruit a thousand pieces of silver. My vineyard, my very own, is before me. You, O Solomon, may have a thousand, and the keepers of the fruit two hundred. O you who dwell in the gardens with companions listening to your voice, let me hear it. Make haste, my beloved, and be like a gazelle or a young stag on the mountain of spices. Now again... Some of this is about human sexuality, and human sexuality was God's idea, so you need to just get over that, okay? But this needs to be within marriage. Amen? All right, God bless you. We'll see you tonight for evening service, 7 o'clock.